We are your friends. We are your neighbors. We are your first electric cooperative, celebrating 75 years of providing reliable, affordable, and safe power. On May 11, 1935, President Franklin D. Roosevelt signed an executive order for the establishment of the Rural Electrification Administration, which passed in 1936. Although Franklin Roosevelt made it a reality to bring power to rural America, it was his cousin, Teddy Roosevelt, who spoke passionately about the farmer's need for electricity. It is the obvious duty of the government to call the attention of farmers to the growing monopolization of water power. The farmers above all should have that power on reasonable terms for cheap transportation, for lighting their homes, and for innumerable uses in the daily tasks on the farm. This quote inspired the movement that brought lights and power into your homes today. Rural electrification was not an easy task, especially in the late 1930s, when America was struggling. Times were hard back in the 30s. They were really hard. My dad was a sharecropper, but unlike Loretta Lynn, I was proud to be a sharecropper's daughter. <laughs> Five men banded together to help make the dream of electric service come true for thousands in rural Arkansas. On October 20th, 1937, the first pole was set at the Vestal Nursery Farm near Jacksonville, the city where the cooperative would be headquartered in 1938. About 300 people watched Governor Carl Bailey, a staunch cooperative supporter, turn the first shovel of dirt from that hole in which the first pole was to be set. Della Frazier was 15 years old in 1938 and living with her family in Furlow, Arkansas. She recalls the moment when the lights came on. Um, and I studied by a kerosene lamp uh, all my school days, you know. And uh, when we got that electric light, one, one string hanging down in the middle of the room with one bulb on it that you had to turn that way, you know. Oh, it was so bright, it was so pretty. And I finished school, uh, you know, by electric lights. It was wonderful. The newly formed cooperative continued to grow. In August 1940, First Electric opened its first district office in Heber Springs for supervision and collection of bills for that section of line. B.J. Swaffer, a former director for First Electric from the Heber Springs District, served as chairman of the cooperative's board for 28 of his 42 years on the board. He remembers vividly how electricity changed his life at an early age. The war efforts got uh, very uh, uh, hot in the 1941. They canceled all the construction with all co-ops because they, they was going to send all the material to the war effort. However, the, the poles and the wires was laying there on the ground, but, but the uh, Congress had stopped the construction of the co-op. So about two months later, my father and two of his neighbors come to the uh, district <clears throat> office and said, if we will install that, can we get it? because they were, the material was there. And they said, sure, so it took them some days to dig those holes because they just dug them by hand. As the co-op began work, they hired linemen who had little training and were forced to work in rugged terrain. Ernie Stark began his employment with First Electric in January of 1949 in the Heber Springs District as a contract employee. He was on the front lines of constructing what is now Cleburne, Independence, Stone, and White County service areas. It was not an easy job to build the lines, as Mr. Stark explains. We'd, we'd get us like a good hole started and get it about 18 inches deep, maybe. And then we'd take this old bar and we'd punch a hole in the middle of that, about two and a half foot deep, and we'd take a quarter of a stick of dynamite and we'd drop it down in there. And we used electric caps with a shooting cord. We'd get at the end of that shooting cord and touch that flashlight battery and we'd shoot that dirt out of that hole and then we'd go clean it, we'd go clean it out. Anyhow, then we'd set the pole, you know, and we had four big old pike poles. They was about so big around, about 15 foot long. And we straightened the pole up with those pike poles and then we tamped it in. First Electric and other cooperatives made great strides by 1950 by extending their lines into rural parts of the state. 
The 1950 census indicated that more than 76% of Arkansas farmers had electric service. In contrast, fewer than 10% of farms in the country had electric service in the 1930s. First Electric continued to develop its infrastructure. During the decade, a new office building was constructed in Perryville, and a new office building was leased in Benton to better serve each district's members. Shelby Lamb was one of the first employees in the Perryville district and recalls working with fellow employee Daryl Dowdy. The crews put in long hours building line and cutting right of way. Daryl and I were the construction crew. We dug the holes, set the poles, and built a uh, one or two span tapper. Daryl was the only one that had a watch. We were cutting right away for a new line down there. About the middle of the evening, I, I said, Daryl, what time is it? I'm getting tired. He looked at his watch, said, three o'clock. I kept on working. Started getting dark. I said, Daryl, I said, it's, it's about time to quit. What time is your watch? Said, he looked at it, three o'clock. <laughs> we kept on working. It got dark. On us. We got in the truck and they called us on the radio from the office. I said, where y'all at? Are you having trouble? I said, yes, sir. We're having trouble with Daryl's watch. Purchasing power also remained a concern for the state's electric cooperatives. Harry L. Oswald, general manager of the statewide organization, discussed the necessity of continuing the effort to build a steam generating plant at First Electric's 1955 board meeting. By the next decade, the steam generating plan was becoming a reality. On June 30th, 1961, a groundbreaking ceremony was held for the construction of the Thomas B. Fitzhugh steam generating plant at Ozark, the first cooperatively owned power generating facility in Arkansas. As the electric cooperatives in Arkansas increased their capacity to generate power, there became the need to encourage members to use electricity. Lois Ann Bryant served as a home economist from 1969 to 1974 and assisted members with the use of electric appliances. One of the most popular appliances was the microwave oven, but the public was skeptical of the new technology. It just had uh, sort of a dangerous connotation at that time, and so I think uh, safety was kind of something they were wondering about, and I think some people actually were afraid that the food might not be safe. Uh, um, but so we had to overcome all that. First Electric's Board of Directors has been instrumental in facilitating the growth and direction of the cooperative from its inception. B.J. Swaffer saw firsthand the impact the cooperative has had on members and community. I think the, the first board that, uh, that was uh, uh, First Electric had, which was in 1937, they realized that you had to have good people. Uh, that was the pattern that was established then and, and it continues today. So, so I think the, the people make the difference in the organization over any other, any other thing. The fact that it's, uh, it's a service driven, not profit driven. In 1964, First Electric constructed its first substation. The Harmon substation in Perry County enabled the cooperative to provide high quality electric service to the members in the Perryville district. As First Electric's power load grew, First Electric shifted from encouraging members to use more electricity to asking them to become more energy efficient as the need began to exceed production. This growth also developed a need to serve members more efficiently, and so too became the need for improved technology. Rick Jones, who started with First Electric in 1978, recounts how they would respond to outages before dispatch was formed. When I came to work for Benton, the, uh, we didn't have dispatching. Uh, First Electric was in the phone book. And all of the linemen that were on call, their names was in the phone book. So when you was on call, when somebody had an outage, they had to call until they got who was on call. And if I was on call, it'd be me. But when I went out on an outage, if it was during the middle of the night, if there was another outage, my wife had to answer the phone. And it, it could go on all night long. She was, was the dispatcher. Uh, we didn't have the radios or anything like that, so if I was way out in the country and uh, took care of an outage, I had to find the phone at midnight or two in the morning to call her to find out if I had any more outages in that area so I wouldn't drive all the way back. 
the biggest improvement to me was when they started dispatching, where we had somebody to talk to. Working for a rural electric cooperative, employees expect the unexpected when out in the field. Uh, let's see, had a dog get in the truck that couldn't get out. That the air show scared. He got in there and he was scared he wouldn't get out. And I had a goat, had a goat get in the truck. Because used to when you get out to read the meters, you'd leave your door open, run over and read it and jump back in the truck. You get back over and there's a goat standing in your seat looking at you and you had to try to get him out. Bear, had a bear, walked to the pole to read a meter. And they had dogs tied out all over the yards with little huts. Well, I was watching them trying to walk between the chains. Guess what was tied to the pole when I got there? A bear. I was doing an energy audit for a, a, a woman one time. It's an older house. I uh, didn't know if there's any insulation in the wall or not. We were sit, literally sitting at her bar in her kitchen. And I said, do you know if there's any insulation in this wall? And she literally, there's a hammer sitting there on the bar. She literally picked it up, knocked a hole in her sheetrock, looked and said, there's no insulation. Throughout the years, First Electric's board has worked diligently to provide its members with safe, reliable, and affordable power. Robert Hill, chairman of the board and board member since 1983, describes his motivation. Well, I want to represent the members as a whole, uh, the new members, the existing members. I want to be able to see to it that they got the uh, best electric service possible at the cheapest price possible. I've always enjoyed being on the board, being able to, to see a project like that started and carried through. Uh, I've also wanted to see where the uh, electricity is going to come from in the future for the next 10 years or 15 years down the road. Uh, we have to plan that for the future and that's part of the board's responsibilities is to uh, approve those items. In 1991, Riceland Electric Cooperative Corporation became part of First Electric. This merger would increase the membership by nearly 3,500, and Riceland's Stuttgart office became a district office of First Electric. Sherry Reed, former Riceland employee and retired First Electric employee, remembers how the merger affected not only the employees, but also the members as well. You know, we were small, you wore 15 hats, you did whatever needed doing, and then we went to First Electric and they had departments that did all of the jobs and things. So yes, there was, there was uh, work that I had done for years that I didn't have to do anymore, but you pick up other things to help the other districts out and stuff. So it was still a very you know, a busy time and things, but it, it was different. Robin Harris, meter technician, describes how meter technology has changed over the years. You know, I remember the days of the old heavy glass meters, you know, with a dial that spun around. And you know, now we have all new digital meters. There is no dial, just the little flashing triangle. And have watched the members kind of, you know, get acquainted with those new meters and lots of changes, but I would say changes for the good. You know, a lot more safety conscious, air conditioners in the trucks. <laughs> in 2004, two important milestones occurred. First, the cooperative moved its headquarters to South J.P. Wright Loop Road, and second, automated meter reading was introduced. This allowed meter reading to be sent via power line carrier communication to First Electric each night. Technology has changed, but one steadfast at First Electric has been the continued retirement of capital credits. This is an important distinction between not-for-profit electric providers and for-profit electric utilities. In December 2010, First Electric returned a record-setting $5.5 million in capital credits to its members. As of 2011, the amount returned to members totaled more than $52.7 million. David Lubke, board member since 2000, talks about the cooperative's philosophy of returning capital credit checks. Well, the members own it, and they're, they're not, it's not a for-profit organization. It has to have money to run, but it's not, you know, an independent one. The you know, stockholders get the money. This we return back to the to the members, which is special. And um, it may not be but twenty-five dollars or a hundred dollars or whatever, but every year that time of year, we always get a lot of compliments. Thank you for sending sending money in the mail. You know, and nobody else does that. And, 
But when you when you part owner of the company, you want it to do well. Don Crabb, president and CEO since 2005, explains the long-term goals for First Electric Cooperative. Well, I, I think again, the, the main thing that we can do is to continue to improve the quality of life uh, for our membership. Uh, and that's by virtue of distributing uh, electricity to them, regardless of how it's generated, regardless of how it's uh, distributed, that uh, will ultimately be the provider of that electric service. What does the next 75 years hold for First Electric Cooperative? I mean, obviously the technology is going to continue to change. You know, when you look back in the way we distribute electricity today versus, you know, where we started, it's, it's, it's basically the same. 75 years from now, who knows the way it's going to be delivered. You know, there was talk several years ago about fuel cells and being in everyone's backyard that you would have your own generation plant, so to speak, in each backyard. And it may go that direction, and I think technology may lead us down that path, but I think it's going to be important for us as electric cooperatives, regardless of how it's made or generated or how it's actually distributed, that we are the power supplier of choice for our members during that particular time. In 75 years, First Electric has transformed from a small rural electric cooperative to the 31st largest cooperative in the United States, all by adapting and changing with the times. There is one thing, though, that has remained the same at First Electric Cooperative. Because I think it's very important for us to realize, even though all these other things have changed, there's, there's one thing that has remained the same. We're owned by those we serve. And so obviously that's the one thing that's the same today as it was 75 years ago. And again, that's what makes us be service-driven versus profit-driven. Because again, you know, anything that we make above the expenses, we assign back to our members and it's their money. When they gave it to us to begin with, it's their money after any margins are left over. But again, what we do with it in between time is what's important from our standpoint, how we deal with that from day to day. Today, 88,000 member accounts strong, serving parts of 17 counties in Arkansas. We are your friends. We are your neighbors. We are your first electric cooperative, dedicated to providing reliable, affordable, and safe power for the next 75 years and beyond.